Yeah, welcome to this uh, podcast. Uh, we are joined today by uh, Professor Istiak Ahmed, who is a Swedish political scientist and author of Pakistani Descent. Professor Ahmed holds a PhD in political science from Stockholm University and is also Professor Emeritus of Political Science at Stockholm University. He is uh, also the Honorary Senior Fellow at the Institute of South Asian Studies, Singapore, and is uh, currently visiting professor at Government College, University Lahore during the spring term. Professor Ahmed has authored over uh, nine books, but altogether he has to credit 14 books because some of his uh, books have been uh, translated. And some of his books uh, are The Punjab Blood Diet, uh, Partition and Cleansed, which was published by Oxford U University Press, Pakistan, The Garrison States, Origins, Evolution and Consequences, which was also published by Oxford University Press. Welcome to this podcast, uh, Professor Ahmed. Thank you very much. Let me just add that the Punjab Bloodied Partition and Cleansed was first published by Rupa Publications, New Delhi in 2011. And recently they have come up with a new edition to mark the 75 years of the partition. 2022. So this was published in both India and Pakistan. And then one book you have not mentioned and which has actually uh, made me well known throughout India and Pakistan is mm -hmm. Jinnah, His Successes, Failures and Role in History, published by Penguin Random House uh, India and Vanguard Books Lahore. And recently, the Urdu translation was also published by Vanguard Books. Okay, okay. so I think I'll complete the important books that you have mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir, for pointing out the uh, third book. Yeah. This, uh, sort of. So, sir, I come now to my first question, which is, you know, about your uh, personal journey. And so you were, uh, you know, born in uh, Lahore, Pakistan. So, so why don't you, you know, go back to your early childhood days and then tell us as to what was the motivation of, you know, like specifically choosing political science at the undergrad level. And then you've, you know, gone on to get your PhD in political science. And in doing so, sir, I, I, it would be you know, great if you can highlight any political scientist uh, that, you know, left an imprint on you, uh, Professor. Yeah. Thank you very much, Manhar Singh, for this question. Well, I'm sure you know that when we started school, nobody thought we'll end up as political scientists or historians or doctors. Yeah. I remember at that time, parents wanted children either to be doctors or engineers. Yeah, It's only over the years when you go to school, then college, then finally you find your talent or your interest is in a different direction and you end up becoming a political scientist. So I would not claim that I was from day one aiming to become a political scientist. This never occurred to me, but as I grew up in Lahore, politics was always being discussed around me and it was always something which uh, whetted my curiosity. It was something which fascinated me. So as I moved up, uh, political science became the subject in which I found myself more at home. And then in 1970, I got the highest marks in MA political science from Punjab University. And uh, so that's my journey. About any political scientist who may have influenced me, yeah. well, I've had teachers like there was... At FC College Lahore, my teacher, uh, William Fazal Masi, an uh, Punjabi Christian gentleman who took a great interest in my education. and uh, But he died very young in a bus accident outside Multan. So that's a tragedy that I remember always. Then at Punjab University, Professor Khalid Mahmood, Mm -hmm. must be mentioned as my mentor who made me think away from, uh, you know, traditional political science and towards the Marxist 
paradigm of mm-hmm. uh, of looking at society so these two when it comes to political science i would like to remember with a lot of uh, gratitude okay so any contemporary political scientist that you, you know, sort of admire uh, in the present era well people admire me a lot so i don't know who should <laughs> i be admiring there are many i mean let me not uh, yes i think there are many and we are all at the top of our career so uh, in my formative phase of course i found uh, reading classics like the one on plato and aristotle okay so i say that plato is the founder of political theory and aristotle the flo- founder of political science okay these are two different approaches okay. and then as you move forward you have many others who profoundly influence you including the social contract theorist yeah yeah Mac- yeah. Machiavelli was someone I found fascinating. Yeah. And then as you move further in time, Karl Marx is always there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We will get yes, it. it is there. So I mean, one can't mention yeah. any one particular political scientist. But Bertrand Russell, I would say, although he was a mathematician, but he was also into uh politics and explaining politics and he also i found very uh, interesting yeah yeah and so the beauty of political science is it is actually you know, cut across uh, you know e- economics as such yes and yes yes so, of course so yeah so i come sir to my next question which is a more of a generic question and it you know sort of brings both economics and political science you know together yes um, so um so you know the study of political science is linked to you know socio economic outcomes and this right. applies both to you know the advanced western uh, uh, countries and developing countries such as india and pakistan and so um one you know political sci- uh, science uh, concept which is you know sort of the um, hallmark of you know how a capitalist uh, you know society is supposed to operate as institutions uh, mm. and so institutions are a set of formal rules which is when you say formal rules that means constitutions i mean correct me if i'm wrong sir yes and yes then, then there are informal you know norms which are cultural norms uh, if i am correct yes. and then there right. is you know shared understanding that uh, you know uh, the political actors you know have to operate within you know these two so sir why yeah. do you identify any one formal rule an informal rule which you know differ in south asia and we are talking of indian pakistan here from other regions of the world given that you know you have like uh, uh, lived across you know many different yeah yes well maybe it's easier to compare and contrast the western systems and the rest i think because what happens in india and pakistan would be similar in many other parts of asia and even africa but comparing with the western systems i think the state and society developed dialectically in yeah. interaction with each other yeah. so it was popular demands for rights and for change which compelled the rulers to to Uh, make changes you know more towards democracy constitutionalism and so on yeah in yeah. the case of the subcontinent i think there was an advanced more educated uh, uh, body of leaders especially in india uh, who whose ideas were based on western notions of democracy liberalism inclusion pluralism yeah and uh, so the society the state elite which founded modern india was more advanced than the society that they were trying to change so many of the changes which came in india came from the top like nobody actually went out to struggle for the right of vote yeah i don't remember any such movement being launched by the people it was the leadership which gave many of these rights the, even the idea of a constitution 
yeah. uh, was borrowed from the Western practices. And I think the same for Pakistan, although the difference is that Pakistan decided to be an ideological state. Uh, so there is a incongruence between the state uh, elite, if we can call it, uh -huh. and the society in general. The society is still very much conservative, traditional, although some people argue that India could become a secular state because Hindus are more amenable to a secular world yeah. order yeah. than others. Yeah. So maybe that is unique about India. Yeah. But in, in the case of Pakistan, uh, one would then argue that secularism didn't have a very strong basis among Muslims. And that is one reason why Pakistan uh, was from day one uh, a poor candidate for a secular type of... But in both societies, there was a discrepancy between the leaders who, who wanted to bring modern change and the society's own rhythm was very different. Okay. And... Uh... Mm, so to you know talk more about you know the institutions yes what's the role you know you think that the political actors you know have played uh you know well, in, i think yeah in india in india the guarantee for a, a secular state is your constitution which uh, even the bjp which is a hindu nationalist party has to uh, submit to because I remember in 1996 when Mr. Vajpayee first got the opportunity to form a government, yeah. he tried for about 13, 17 days but gave up saying that democracy is a game of numbers and we don't have the numbers with us. So that was an excellent uh, or I think a classic statement in support of the institutions established by the Indian constitution. And I think that still is quite robust in India, although some people are complaining that, uh, you know, changes are being made and that secular state may be under threat and so on. Mm -hmm. So I thought I will point that out. But in, in Pakistan, uh, institutions never mattered from day one. They were flouted, uh, blatantly violated by those who came to power, like Mr. Jinnah, mm -hmm. he became the governor general and mm -hmm. not prime minister. Mm -hmm. But as governor general, he exercised powers which even the viceroys didn't have. And he dismissed elected governments and made statements which came to haunt Pakistan. So India and Pakistan are two different cases. Mm -hmm. India institutions are entrenched mm -hmm. and violating them is not easy. Mm -hmm. It happens, of course. Uh, the emergency is a case in point, mm -hmm. but it was corrected in time then. Uh, but in Pakistan, institutions have never bettered. The only institution which uh, is strong and whose will prevails is the Pakistan military or Pakistan army. And to a, to a certain extent, the bureaucracy. But mm -hmm. those are supposed to serve the state, not the government in power and not rule, but they do in Pakistan. Okay. So, sir, uh, when, uh, you know, let's say an economist, you know, talks about institutions, they do it from the perspective of how does institutions, you know, uh, the rules of the game, you know, help you to separate what is yours against vis-a-vis -vis others, right? What is my property, right? So, in that context, uh, Professor, uh, what are your thoughts on the fact that institutions have sort of helped you know, the Indian economy, uh, you know, take on the trajectory that is had, I mean, that it, it did after, you know, 1991, right? So how closely linked is economic institutions, you know, to the political institutions, right? Uh, both of them sort of feed into each other. They do. I totally endorse that point of view. Yeah. India decided to be a, a sort of free market economy with a strong presence of the state in regulating the economy. Yeah. And uh, therefore, in the 1990s, when they realized that the old system, you know, state license yes. system doesn't work, yeah. they opened up. And it's not the uh, BJP who started all this. It was, I think, 
Nasimara Rao and Manmohan Singh who started these processes. Yes. And so I think the two have worked together. It's a market economy. Yeah. Uh, a capitalist economy, but one in which the state is required to uh, intervene to see to it that some sort of justice is maintained. Now people are saying that that is under threat, but I don't know. I thought I'll just make this observation. Uh, so that's it. Yeah. And so, sir, why do you think this has not happened in the case of Pakistan till yet? Uh, the the I economic institutions. Pakistan from day one had no vision on which to found Pakistan as a political system. They had ideas of an Islamic state and another was a Muslim democracy, a spiritual democracy. And some say that Jinnah finally wanted a secular state, which I think is all rubbish because he made just one such speech and then reverted to Islam being important to the politics and law and constitution of Pakistan. So they have not, for them it's not been clear what institutions to establish, what sort of constitution to have, which is both Islamic and democratic. What we find it is that it's a mix of both, but as a result, it is neither fish nor fowl. That's Pakistan's problem. So, so, so you, would you make the case then that because the political institution was not like you know firmly interest that sort of has not aided in the economic institutions you know helping pakistan to come up you know the economic ranks well it's not as simple as that uh, the institutions were never strong never uh, deeply rooted from day one uh, but when the military took over in 58, mm -hmm. they got a lot of aid from the World Bank and America yeah. to establish a pro-capitalist economy. And for a while, they did very well. Okay. Pakistan's rate of growth was 5.3% and India's 2.7%. Yeah. But then they started the 65 war. And my argument has been that from that time onwards, uh -huh. that chance of industrializing uh -huh. You know, not everywhere uh, democracy and all really matters. After all, Singapore... Yeah, yeah, yeah. China is a classic case. Yeah, uh, they have made fantastic economic yes. gains without being democratic. Yes. So this linkage people make is only um, one of the possibilities. The two are not necessarily dependent on one another. Yes. But if they come together, then there is a balance between democracy yes. and a successful economy, which is the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. So, so I come, sir, uh, to my next question, which is, you know, yeah. bring up, you know, the uh, concepts of Marxism. Yes. And also, you know, the struggle which, uh, you know, took place in the 20th century, you know, known as Cold War, which was nothing but a competition between communism and capitalism. Yes. So, um, so the Communist Manifesto, uh, it did, you know, highlight that the the system, the capitalist system, was actually unstable because it sort of inexploited the last section of you know working class, right? And so that that sort of was the you know the breeding ground for what took place in Russia, known as the Russian Revolution, and you know the spread of communism. So yeah, so why don't you you know like enlighten us about you know what happened? Uh, prior to the Russian Revolution and then like during the spread of communism in China. <clears throat> so what is your question? So my question is, uh, so why don't you tell us about the uh, the rise of communism, which is yes. the Russian Revolution. And yes. also, you know, the communism was, uh, you know, spearheaded in China also by the Chinese communists. Yes. Well, it's a big question to begin with. Yeah. Marx. Uh, primarily, but also Engels developed this idea of uh, historical materialism and uh, dialectical, dialectical materialism. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, saying that society moves forward because of the unity and struggle between opposites. Yeah, and uh, Marx would then talk about 
uh, once upon a time, a society without classes, primitive sort of communism, where people lived by the day, you know, without being uh, divided into classes. But then through the invention of tools and, and uh, organized agriculture, mm -hmm. a surplus began to be produced. Mm -hmm. And that resulted in society being divided by between those who were clever and strong, who started owning the means of production, mm -hmm. and they forced the others to work for them mm -hmm. to produce a surplus. Mm -hmm. And Marx would then argue in the Communist Manifesto and Engels mm -hmm. that then society became divided into uh, slave owners and slaves, which later on, because of the conflict between the two, mm -hmm. the unity and struggle of the opposites mm -hmm. finally resulted in more technological changes taking place. So instead of a thousand slaves, you needed only maybe 50 peasants to work with the plow to yeah. produce a surplus. Yeah. So it led to feudalism. Yeah. And then he says that technological changes are the basis for change in society and this continues all the time uh -huh. and the next change was that people started inventing machines uh -huh. and with the machines coming over the large scale production became possible uh -huh. and that resulted in uh, factory or mill level productions where you had hundreds and thousands of workers doing a simple task to produce one product and that is the capitalist system. Mm -hmm. And Marx, the way he argued was that from the changes take place first quantitatively and then they become qualitative and that's when the new society emerges. Mm -hmm. And working on this assumption, mm -hmm. he said that capitalism would also go under because a few monopoly capitalists will own everything and force the middle class into the working class and then there will be a popular revolution in the most advanced parts of uh, the world mm -hmm. germany and uh, england especially he mentioned mm -hmm. uh, and so socialism will come into place and then socialism will be built uh, it will be a worldwide uh, process mm -hmm. and everywhere socialism will produce start producing uh, goods on a large, large scale, and then society will become a society of abundance. People okay. will be able to produce things in abundance, and therefore there would be no need for classes to be created. Like automation will take over. You know, artificial intelligence in one way, yeah. Marx anticipated that robots will be doing so many tasks. Yeah. So, But the problem is that was a very elegant uh, formula that he introduced. He said yeah. even in nature, yeah. nature also is this dialectical materialism, you know, a seed becomes a plant and then a plant goes under and a new thing emerges. Things like this yeah. partly borrowed from Hegel but also given material uh -huh. background. So that was the way they thought the world will ultimately change until all classes will be abolished and the whole world community will become one free people, there would be no workers and no rulers, there would be no state, no police, no nothing. Yeah. Now the thing is, as a as a as a grand mega theory, it's fascinating. Yeah. And it captured my youth as it did of so many other people. Yes. But now the thing is, in practice, the this is not what happened. Yes. Already the Russians started arguing that uh uh, we can make a revolution not until all Russians become workers, but even yes. when it's a peasant society and we can have a vanguard party which can capture the state and then the workers can, peasants can be organized to create socialism. Yeah. And during the First World War, Lenin was able to capture power and establish the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union was declared as the citadel of world communism and uh, uh, they had to fight a bloody civil war and yeah. western powers were occupying the soviet union so into the 30s that struggle kept on uh, going on yeah but finally the soviet union 
under Joseph Stalin was consolidated. Yeah. But then came the Second World War. Yeah. And once again, the Soviet Union had to face the brunt of uh, fascism and Nazism, especially Nazism, you know, which is rapidly anti-communist. And, and uh, the Soviet Union could never become what was to be called a democratic sort of society. It was centrally controlled, maybe, maybe over-controlled, overly controlled. Okay. And and some accused Stalin of creating even totalitarianism. Okay. But anyhow, they were able to build a functioning system and defeat yeah. uh, uh, the Germans. Yeah. This argument that a vanguard party can lead without the workers being a major portion of the society was then yeah. uh, used by Mao saying that in China, it's not even the working class, but the peasantry, the most... Yeah. exploited who can be the leading class. Yeah. So he was able to build uh, Soviet communism. Yes. Sorry, Chinese communism through people's uh, struggle rather yeah, they, than the world. They call struggle. it communism with Chinese characteristics. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So in both these societies you found communism as a dogma being uh, instituted by the state there was a constitution promising yeah. everything yeah but the state control was total and i think there is a problem when there's a state control and the rulers even with the best intentions don't yeah. know what the people want yeah the lack of communication can create frustration among the people yes and you know the soviet system collapsed and the chinese what they did was they just retained the Communist Party's complete yes. control, yes. but but have made uh, China a very successful capitalist society with a strong state being partnered in it. Yes, so that's what has happened. And uh, as compared to this, there was the old social democratic movement that uh, socialism can also be built by democratic means. Yes, and that was the thesis of Bernstein and Kautsky and all these people in Germany. Okay, and I think the social democratic uh, Scandinavian countries are yes. an example of yes socialism being built by democratic means. Although now, yeah, even that system is overtaken by the globalization or neoliberal capitalism. But still, the welfare state is well entrenched. Okay. So, sir, um, uh, you would you argue then that you know communism or you know socialism they were uh, they were simply not able to you know compete with the capitalist way of you know society. They well, not... it seems it seems they failed in that. So, sir, because... uh, so would you attribute the failure of the socialism to lack of how the political main players they sort of uh, so what do you attribute you know the failure to lack of their understanding of how they should have operated or was it due to the capitalist system being overly better like they were you know the capitalist no system. i think yeah i think first of all there was no uh, model or template they could follow they had to do everything from a scratch okay and Already the idea of making a revolution in not the most advanced parts of the world, but in a um, peripheral part, which is uh, Tsarist Russia, was a break with what Marx had been saying, that quantity changes into quality, and Germany mm -hmm. would be, or England, where the revolution would come. So mm -hmm. there was a deviation. And let me point out that Marx himself corrected his historical materialism when he came to China and India. Okay. He said that these societies were not based on private property being owned by some and denied by others, but by a state monopolizing all surplus. And therefore, he called it the Asiatic mode of production. So already in Marx, there is an admission that historical materialism, whatever he understood, yeah. applied to Western history and yeah. not Asia or Africa and and. India and so on. So already you find Marx conceding that 
outside Europe, things were, or, or outside the Western world, things were very different. Okay. Okay. And then Lenin makes a revolution, which is not exactly quantity changing into quality, but capturing power in the name of the working class through a vanguard party and trying to build socialism. Okay. I think they were quite successful in eliminating poverty, in giving everybody a right to go to school, uh, yeah. uh, subsidized housing, very cheap, yeah. excellent medical, all those things did, but they failed in giving people a sense of freedom. Yeah. Everything was subject to state control. Yeah. And I think that created a lot of frustration among young people who were not part of the revolution and the sacrifices of the earlier generations. Yeah. For them, the Western world was free and they did things as they wanted, individuals. Yeah. Uh, in, in Soviet Russia, that was not possible. Okay. And in China, I think what they have done is that uh, they have been trying to eliminate poverty, but the, any democratic opposition is crushed. Uh, yeah. And thus far, they have been successful. Yes. So that's how things have been in China and then in Soviet Russia. But what I'm saying is yeah. that the old Soviet or uh, Marxist method of historical materialism, yeah. already in the life of Marx, he admitted this didn't apply outside the Western yeah. historical experience. Yeah. And then uh, Lenin and then Mao changed basically... Yeah the basic argument of quantity changing into quality and so on and so forth. The vanguard, you know, dictatorship of the proletariat was just a name. It was dictatorship of the Politburo. Yes. And I, I'm not saying that the Politburo did not serve the people. They did a lot for the people yeah. of Russia. They yeah. brought people from all over the world, gave them free education, made them doctors, engineers. Yeah. And they, the Soviet state especially helped the freedom struggles of Asia and Africa a lot. Yeah. I don't think the Chinese have done much for the freedom struggle of the world. Yeah. But the or the Soviet state did. Yes. So they have made fantastic contributions uh, to the freedom of the world. But yeah. themselves, they were not able to let citizens travel easily, yeah. marry, I mean, go from one place to another. And that doesn't work, I tell you. Yeah. So, so uh, you said that Marx was, he admitted, you know, that his sort of method did not apply to, you know, the Asia. Yeah. So any audience, if they want to trace that reference to, where can they trace that to? Is it in a book or like? No, it's a huge book. The oh. Asiatic book of production. It's a okay. huge work of Marx. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, Professor Ahmed, so I now come to, uh, you know, the Weberian definition definition of, you know, class, which uh, consists of, you know, ident uh, classifying class only in terms of, you know, the labor market uh, relations. So to substantiate this, the working class is defined as a seller of raw labor power, the middle class as seller of skilled labor power, and the capitalist class as purchasers of uh, labor power. So, uh, Professor, is this uh, characterization adequate or are there other ways that, you know, classes are defined from a political science uh, perspective? For instance, classes are not defined in terms of categories of occupation, but also in terms of uh, social relations of control over investment, decision making, other people's work and one's own work. Yeah, sir, why don't you, you know, throw uh, light here? No, first of all, the way I've read Max Weber, uh, besides this way of describing classes, he yeah. adds two more things. He says it has a class is also known by status and by the power. So mm -hmm. he doesn't just have the economic definition. He says Marx has not, uh, Marxism misses the point that status may plays a very important role, as well as the power you enjoy when in a position of power. So okay. his idea of class includes these social uh, relations, political influence, all that is included. So I understand Weber differently. And I think what you have elaborated then is also uh, not necessarily against what Weber has said, but only shows that as we move forward in uh, you know, development of 
uh, industrial society, modern economy, yeah. new type of classes, <coughs> relations emerge. Yeah, and, specialization. Uh, yes, specialization. Yeah. And I think that would be, for Weber, would be acceptable. Uh, so I think you have to look at his emphasis on status uh, and class. For example, let me make it a very simple example. A poor Brahmin would still have a lot of uh, status and even maybe power mm -hmm. than a, a Dalit who is, uh, you know, comparable to his position economically or even uh, is a superior power holder formally. Mm -hmm. So status, I think, is also important uh, in, a, in a society. And, uh, you know, senior professors have a lot of power and status and they operate more or less like uh, feudal, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, people when they run their setup. So I think Weber needs to be understood in that context as well. Okay. So, and so, uh, so one uh, question is that, do you think that that sort of class, uh, you know, analysis is sort of uh, like more applicable in today's time when, you know, your uh, profession sort of depends upon, you know, the specialization of your knowledge, skill set, and all those things, you know, come into the picture. And status sort of is no longer that relevant in today's time. It's, it's more about, you know. Well, I don't know. Where are we talking about today's time? Because status still plays a very important role. Even in the Western world, there are these uh, old aristocratic families whose influence is far greater than the actual ownership of property, or most of them are oh, property owners and so on. Okay. So uh, I think as we democratize, as more people move up, yeah, the old order will start uh, losing its grip, but we are still far away from it, you know. Uh, but no doubt, the modern world, as we create more wealth, uh, more people are pulled out of poverty yeah. and become part of the middle class, the old order will start changing. This is true. Okay. And so do you see this happening, uh, you know, anywhere? In the world, you think India is a classic case where this is starting? Yes, I think in India, uh, many people are, you know, making careers as entrepreneurs after getting a good education. India has been successful in providing sound education even to people in school, uh, in villages, far away villages. Yeah. While in India recently, I met several who came from very humble backgrounds. Yeah. And they said we didn't even have a water tap in our home. But now we are owners of uh, IT industries and the turnover is 14 crore every year. Now that's an amazing number. Of yeah. course, these would be a handful of people, but uh, as they rise, new people, new jobs are created and they are pulled out of the old order. So this is happening everywhere in the world. Nothing is constant and stable. You know, look at Saudi Arabia now being forced to give up its old, uh, you know, hardcore Islamism in favor of some sort of modern state and uh, with freedoms and so on. Mm -hmm. I'm sure another totalitarian type of system, Iran will also uh, undergo such change. So the world is changing for the better mm -hmm. in many ways of the world. What we are not taking care of is not just the social aspect, but environment and climate change, that seems to be neglected. Yes, absolutely. And uh, so, Professor, I, you know, come back to a paper that you wrote, uh, which was titled The Rise and Fall of Left and the Maoist uh, Movements in Pakistan. So it yes. was published in India quarterly in the year 2010, right? Right. There right. you sort of um, say that uh, during the uh, late 1960s and early 70s, Maoist ideas had gained considerable popularity and influence in the left politics and labor movement. Yeah. Uh, so, sir, why don't you yeah, talk about you know yeah uh, this? 
Yes. Well, you know, when Pakistan came into being, uh, while India became a sort of a bourgeois democracy, Pakistan couldn't even become that. It became a state very hostile to any ideas of uh, socialism, secularism, trade unionism, and they were under attack from day one. And so the communists in Pakistan were always on the margins. Mm -hmm. uh, the CID and the police were always pursuing them. It's too well known. In India, of course, they could, they had to change their ways from armed revolution and Telangana and, and, and go for elections. And once they did that, mm -hmm. they were able to form governments also. So, but in Pakistan, the state was from day one, rapidly anti-socialist and anti-secular. And uh, they smashed the left whenever they got a chance. Uh, but in the 1960s, when this India-China war yeah. took place. Mm -hmm. uh, Pakistan got a chance now to establish some sort of understanding with China and China with Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was largely Zulfkar Ali Bhutto, the foreign minister, who paved the way for China-Pakistan good relations. And then Bhutto Saab fell out of favor with Ayub Khan and built his own Pakistan People's Party. Mm -hmm. And that People's Party then after the breakup of Pakistan came into power. But, you know, from the late 60s, uh, when Ayub Khan fell from power and Yahya Khan was ruling, but the Chinese, Pakistan's relations with China had improved already at that time. So a lot of Maoist literature began to be freely read in Pakistan. And uh, I was one among many other young people who were fascinated by the idea of a revolution inspired mm. by Mao's idea of a peasant uprising. Mm. Mm. And uh, we joined the Mazdoor Kisan party. There were other pro-Mao influence parties as well. And uh, student organizations, NSF, NSO, and many others yeah. who were trying to... Uh, go for a, a, a peasant type of revolution in Pakistan. And uh, I think in the late 60s, uh, actually early 70s, the uh, Mazdoor Kisan party even tried an armed uprising in the Northwest Frontier province in Hashtnagar and these areas. And there were people killed on both sides. But then with Mr. Bhutto in power, mm -hmm. uh, when in December 1972, the Maoists tried to capture factories and mills and occupy them in, mm -hmm. in uh, uh, Punjab and in Karachi. Mm -hmm. Bhutto then ordered the police to go after them and they were smashed. And so, uh, but during these two, three years, communism or Maoism became mm -hmm. acceptable because Maoism, 50 fitted into India's, Pakistan's anti-India sort of uh, uh, politics. Mm -hmm. So being a Maoist also meant you that you were very anti-India and that suited the state. Mm -hmm. uh, so for a while they had a free hand, but as soon as they tried seriously to go for a revolution mm -hmm. and uh, resistance, let's say, mm -hmm. the state came down and smashed them. So that was a very short period of Maoist uh, 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 influence all over Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And it was crushed very badly. Okay. So you, you talk about Maoist, uh, you know, feeding into Pakistan's anti-India narrative. So there was one yeah. other, uh, you know, gentleman uh, known as Gangadhar Adhikari, who was a yeah. communist uh, theoretician, theo, you know, theoretician. Yes. Yeah, so there is a famous Adhikari thesis also, where he said that, I mean, if I understand correctly, he said that India will break into, you know, a small uh, state, like disintegrate, but that obviously has not happened. So, yeah, why don't you talk, uh, sir, about this? Well, nobody knows why Adhikari and the Communist Party of India came up with this most silly 
thesis because it made no sense. You see, if you have read the thesis, mm -hmm. primarily Adhikari identifies oppressed nationalities. And oppressed nationalities, he counts as uh, Bengalis, Sindhis, Marathis, Maharashtrians, Gujaratis. Mm -hmm. Everybody is an oppressed nationality for having the right of self-determination. Mm -hmm. But when it came to Punjab, there is no oppressed Punjabi nationality. Rather, he says that the Sikhs and Muslims are also oppressed nationalities. Now, first of all, mm -hmm. the definition when it comes to the Sikhs and mm -hmm. Muslims is based on religion. Mm -hmm. And the Punjabi Hindus are not mentioned in that because there is no Punjabi oppressed nationality right, having the right of self-determination, but Sikhs having and the Muslims having. Mm -hmm. Now that fitted in very well with what Jinnah was saying. The two-nation theory was already a part of politics and becoming mm -hmm. popular because during the Second World War, Jinnah was supporting the British. Mm -hmm. The Congress were opposing it. Mm -hmm. And so Adhikari coming up with this thesis made no sense. Mm -hmm. And what they did was they compelled Muslim communists. That's a very strange word. Communists who were Muslims to join the Muslim League mm -hmm. so that uh, the Muslim League campaign can become a progressive sort of uh, Islamic socialism campaign. Mm -hmm. Who advised them from where? They, some say that the Soviet Union uh, in, uh, wanted them to take up such a position because in the 1930s, mm -hmm. uh, Stalin and others had come to the conclusion that India cannot have a revolution, socialist mm -hmm. revolution, because uh, Gandhi's teaching were non-violent and that was for compromise. Mm -hmm. So India will not have an armed revolution. Maybe Pakistan with its jihad and all could become a socialist. This was the most absurd uh, sort of thesis, whether it came from Stalin Mm -hmm. Or it was Adhikari and others who came to this conclusion. And I, I say, look, if you say there are oppressed uh -huh. nationalities, then if they are based on language, Sindhis, uh -huh. Bengalis and the rest, uh -huh. then Punjabis should be an oppressed nationality. Yeah. But in you say Sikhs and uh, Muslims. Yeah. But we all know that the most oppressed people anywhere in the subcontinent have been Dalits. Yeah. So why not identify the Dalits also as an oppressed nationality. Yeah. There is no mention of it. And uh, Adhikari thesis, while not directly supporting the two-nation theory, practically supported it. And the communists joined the Muslim League, and I quote Jinnah on 19th uh, March 1944, his speech in Lahore saying, you communists, yeah. hands off, hands off, Hands off. You think we are uh, stupid? Perhaps there is a grain of truth. But I tell you, we have our own Islamic ideology. Yeah. We don't want any yellow or red-ism. Yeah. So uh, Jinnah is on record telling the communists, we don't want you in the Muslim League. But they went there and, you know, the Muslim League, mullahs were calling it an Islamic state. Yeah. The communist Muslims, uh, C.R. Aslam and uh, uh, Abdullah Malik and others, yeah. uh, they started using it, okay, we will get rid of the Hindu moneylender, the Sikh uh, yeah. moneylender and all that to give it a class type yeah. of character. Yeah. And, and uh, so the Adhikari thesis, first of all, if you look at Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, Trotsky, all these great names, uh, they all say that a nation cannot be based on religion. Yeah. Uh, it has to be based on uh, common language, mm -hmm. common national character, yeah. an economy which can develop, yeah. and a, a common territory, these yeah. four. Yeah. Uh, and so the Adhikari thesis identifying Muslims and Sikhs yeah. as oppressive realities was a negation of Marxist teaching. Yeah. And in any case, 
the Sikhs were not demanding a separate state. Uh, although there were Sikhs demanding a Khalistani state, of course. So maybe Adhikari had that in mind as well. Okay. But what a thing to do, that's it. Okay. So, uh, so given that, you know, what is happening in Pakistan is now not hidden, you know, from the world. So would you... Sorry? I'm saying what is happening in Pakistan in terms of, you know, the operation of all classes of people... Is not yeah. it's not hidden, you know, from the world, right? Yes. Would that thesis, Adhikari thesis, is applicable now in the case of Pakistan, where you know the country is reeling under you know economic uh, uh, you know pressures and you know other sorts of pressures also? Would you buy that? So, tell me what you understand. I don't think you understand the Adhikari thesis the way I do. It talks now... disintegration. Uh, yeah, you know, the state breaking into small pieces and on all those uh, points, but, you know, a common language, uh, you know, common territory, one army. No, but he did not. That's what I'm saying. Okay. When it came to Muslims and Sikhs, okay, uh, he identified them as oppressed nationalities. So Adhikari okay. thesis was uh, a major blunder. Okay. Uh, because Pakistan is now 90... 6% Muslim. Okay. But then you are right, they are also uh, linguistic nationalities now fighting one another, but yes. Adhikari had no clue about that. Okay. Yes, that's what I'm saying. He was not consistent okay. in his definition of nationalities. Okay. When it came to Sikhs and Muslims, he called them oppressed nationalities. All others were linguistic nationalities. Okay. And then if Really, oppression is the word for a nationality. Then uh -huh. tell me, is there any nationality or people more oppressed than the Dalits in yeah. Hindu society, yeah. Yeah. in society, in Muslim society? Yeah. So yeah. Adhikari's thesis was, uh, I makes no sense to me at all, and it doesn't apply to Pakistan. Okay. Because uh, uh, classical Marxism did talk about. Uh, linguistic nationalities and all, but that's not what Adhikari thesis is. It's a communal thesis. Okay. Okay. So, sir, I come to the next question, which is I, I linked, uh, you know, uh, to your uh, book, uh, which is State uh, Ethnicity, which was published in the year 1996. In that yeah. book, you actually make a case that the emerging middle class can potentially be a major local force for you know human development, human development, including yeah. a concerted political effort to reduce state reliance on coercion and to address yeah. inequities across communal, class, and yeah. gender lines. Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Please, uh, you know, throw some light on this. Well, I've I've said that uh, the way the modern world is structured, uh, the state can always defeat internal rebellion. Look at what happened in India. The Khalistan movement was crushed mercilessly. The Kashmir separatist movement was crushed mercilessly. Mm -hmm. And in the Northeast, whatever attempt has been made as all have also been crushed. No chance that you can secede from India. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, and because the modern state is strong enough. The classic example, which actually proves my theory, is uh, Sri Lanka, where the Tamils, who had really created a lot of, you know, armed resistance and so on, were crushed because nobody came to their aid. So my theory has been that the modern state is strong enough to crush internal rebellion. The only time it fails to do that is when a major or a superpower intervenes on behalf of a, a group of people wanting to uh, secede, as happened in the case of East Pakistan, where India intervened and helped the Bengalis break out of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And the reason was that the Pakistan and East Pakistan borders were not uh, contiguous. Uh, in between was India and Pakistan army could not 
supply men and uh, armament yeah. and therefore they could not have fought successfully and indian intervention helped them become free okay but that so that is not a rule the rule is internal rebellion doesn't make a case okay uh, in pakistan uh, the baloch have been crushed uh, any attempt by the sindhis have been crushed yeah uh, but now of course the pakistani state is beset with so many problems yeah. that it can disintegrate but then the disintegration has to come from within like the way the soviet union collapsed oh, it's okay. not the it's not the nationalities who left the soviet union it's the yeah. center which collapsed okay yeah. yeah so pakistan may disintegrate but not because uh the peripheral nationalities are strong enough to do it because the center may not be able to hold on so okay. that's another possibility i yeah. also mentioned in my book i am okay. saying short of that the best thing is to create uh, federal systems where uh, power is fairly shared between an effective center without yeah. an effective center there is no state yeah. and the provinces yeah and equitable sharing of uh, the national resources yeah. and uh, public intellectuals the middle class yeah and others the civil society demanding greater freedom greater equality greater resources yeah for lifting people out of poverty i think i have a third of third world social democratic model in mind Okay. It, a, a democracy which is also concerned about uh, lifting people out of poverty so it's not free market economy uh, creating a successful middle class but also a state uh, giving uh, oppressed people the chance to come up through education Absolutely. through better health, health yeah. facilities and so okay? Yeah. okay so this is you know happening in india maybe at a greater yeah i think the last in india years. it is happening yes correct yeah. and, in uh, bangladesh it is happening bangladesh yeah, is happening absolutely yes yeah. there also yeah. and so sir so i come now you know to my last question yeah uh, which is you know linked to your recent visit to india and pakistan so you were in india for like 2 3 months if i am correct you yeah were, almost 3 months yeah. and in pakistan 2 months and 1 week in fact you gave a lecture at gokhale institute of uh, politics and economics which is where i have my masters from ah oh, lovely yeah. yeah so sir i come now to one you know question which is you know given that your you know ex- experience and expertise on you know the the subject of uh, political science yeah if possible can you identify two pressing social science research questions that any young researcher you know can navigate uh, yes sir well one is the uh, problem of populism which is i think deeply undermining uh, democracy uh, in in the subcontinent i think populism is a very dan- dangerous phenomenon uh, it is pseudo democracy it's like majoritarianism mm-hmm. and one has to go back and and find the proper balance between uh you know the freedom of individuals mm-hmm. and the right of uh you know large or majority groups and minority groups to continue with their uh, sort of uh, you know different uh, uh identities and not merging into one nation mm-hmm. of free individuals mm-hmm. and i think the uniform civil code uh, the i find the leftist people not really understanding that it could be something good for everyone in india so yeah. a number of political science things have to be undertaken what sort of state creates a fair open system in which minorities feel free and the majority feels confident to rule according to the rules of the game which is yeah. the constitution and yeah. 
when it comes to pakistan yeah. everything has to be done from the scratch yeah. you know pakistan cannot be compared with india in in that sense yeah. so pa- but pa- still, pa- sir, any work, one but, any one yeah. you know major issue that you think that needs to be taken care of in pakistan there are plenty of but course, if you have to course, address... i think in uh, bringing religion into politics into law into constitution that must be critically examined it has done so much harm to pakistan that i can't tell you so trying to create a pakistan in the light of the real or imagined experience of the 7th century is a disastrous undertaking so mm-hmm. somebody has to do that and i have already my doctoral thesis called the concept of an islamic state and analysis of the ideological controversy in pakistan is already a contribution in that direction okay i have not seen anyone pursue it okay. afterwards so if anyone yeah. wants to get your thesis where can they go to is it available uh, try try you know uh, we are now going to have it republished very soon so just wait of for a, for a okay. short while and i'll let you know okay yeah yeah thank you sir any other last point professor you might no, i think i uh, think we needed to discuss these things and i'm very glad i was able to explain my position on marxism yeah uh, i say any philosophy any way of thinking which becomes a dogma yeah ultimately defeats the purpose of free thought yeah and marxism or no marxism the basic thing is that people should be treated fairly yeah and Uh, they should be uh, helped get out of poverty there should yeah. be the rule of law yeah and uh, gender equality all this is important yeah and it doesn't happen just through the armed revolution yeah. a peaceful way to a better society is also possible and that's yeah. where i think we have to keep our options open all the time absolutely so i you know end this with this line that you have in your website treat others the way you want to be treated yes yeah. this is a categorical imperative that i should treat others yeah with respect not as a tactic but as a duty absolutely and and the principle is i should not treat others in a way i don't want them to treat me yeah absolutely simple as that yeah thank you sir it was such a learning experience over this last you know 60 minutes getting it i'm glad Yeah. we had this opportunity thank you manhar singh thank you thank sir. you very much and i wish you all the best thank you sir thank you so much and i wish the same for you thank you sir thank you thank you, thank you.